All right, well, welcome back. Glad to see everyone this morning, and uh, it's always a great thing to dig into God's Word and, and fill our hearts and minds with good things. So uh, hopefully you have an explorer sheet that kind of gives you the points that I'm hoping to get across this morning. And uh, I don't know about you, I never get tired of hearing God's Word, of reading God's Word. It is living and active. It, it meets our needs even when uh, we're not thinking about it. And uh, today we get a chance once again to, to dig into some important things, the way in which uh, God's people are drawn into greater faithfulness and are put in a position where they're going to exercise their faith and see God show up. And I think that's the challenge for us. Uh, in our dark moments, in our valleys, are we giving God the chance to, uh, to sustain us, to, to keep us uh, strong and to keep us on target? Um, today's message is called uh, Long Way Around the Barn. And I guess, I don't know, if, you, if you've ever talked to someone that likes to talk, um, they bring up a story they want to get to, and we sometimes we get frustrated because we want to know what the, uh, you know what the finality of it is. And, and they're such storytellers. They, they go the long way around the barn. Instead of going right there with the doors, they go the long way around the barn. And, and sometimes if you're out of time, you've got to kind of cut them off and say, hey, so, you know, get to the point, I've got to go. Um, and I think sometimes that's how people have dealt with their decision to put their faith in Christ. They, uh, they take the long way around this idea of, you know, all right, is there a God? Okay, there's a God. Uh, what do I do about that? How has he revealed himself? Who is Jesus? And then get to the very end, and they finally make that decision for Christ. Well, I'm here today to tell you that the wise man does it once, what the fool does it last. And uh, a lot of times I use that verse to, uh, to give me a kick in the pants for my procrastination and I think it's never good to procrastinate, wait till the last minute. And I'm here to tell you it's never good to procrastinate when it comes to making a decision for Christ. If you know it's true and you understand it's what you need, why wait? I guess that's my encouragement to you. And I think we're going to see that in the scriptures here that Israel took the long way around the barn. They did not trust in the Lord at first. And... Uh, but I think the thing that's nice to see is as Assyria gets closer and closer, it actually is now getting into Judah, right? It's, it is, uh, it is uh, taking out the cities of Israel, and it's going into Judah. It's taking out the cities of Judah, and it's going to come to the very walls of Jerusalem. And in that moment, the question is going to be, are they going to finally trust in Jesus or Trust in God. I guess that's, uh, you know, we understand our dilemma is trusting in Jesus. For them, Jesus hadn't been revealed yet, but Yahweh was their God and uh, makes those same promises. If you trust in me, uh, you will be okay. And that's the proclamation of the gospel. If you trust in Jesus, uh, death can be right there at the door, um, but you'll be okay. So there's a lot here. This is one of those things where it's a little kind of a struggle to know how much I'll be able to share with you. But uh, we are going to go into 2 Kings chapter 18 to, to talk about the history of what's happening. But we are going to read the scripture in Isaiah. That's our focus. We're going through the book of Isaiah. So why don't we read uh, chapter 33, and then I'll go and give you some background of what's actually happening. Because what's happening here is uh, serious and dire, and uh, there's a lot of desperation. <clears throat> but in that desperation, God is not continuing to hammer on them, but is beginning to share that message of hope, that God is going to show up, that he is going to be the Savior. Here, uh, just so you know, just a little bit of the history, uh, Hezekiah, in a moment of weakness, actually tried to send a tribute to Assyria. He actually took the gold from all the implements in the temple, so here's Isaiah, a good king, reigned for 29 years, but he had a moment of weakness as they showed up at the, the very gates of the city, and he stripped the gold from the, the items in the temple and sent that gold tribute to Assyria. It was a sad moment. And, uh, but in that sad moment, Hezekiah was going to come to his senses. Those guys don't keep their promises. They didn't. But God keeps his promises. He can be relied upon. And he's the only way out. 
So let me read to you Isaiah 33, starting in verse 1. As you can imagine, this is Isaiah standing on the wall of Jerusalem proclaiming the the woe to Assyria. 185,000 Syrian troops surrounding this little multi-acre city of Jerusalem. And Isaiah is on the hill. Maybe you could hear him proclaiming it. He says, What sorrow awaits you, Assyrians, who have destroyed others but have never been destroyed yourselves? You betray others, but you have never been betrayed. And when you are done destroying, you will be destroyed. And when you are done betraying, you will be betrayed. But the Lord, be merciful to us, for we have waited for you. Be our strong arm each day and in our salvation in times of trouble. The enemy runs at the sound of your voice. When you stand up, the nations flee. Just as caterpillars and locusts strip the fields and vines, so the fallen army of Assyria will be stripped. Though the Lord is very great and lives in heaven, he will make Jerusalem his home of justice and righteousness. In that day, he will be your sure foundation providing a rich store of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord will be your treasure. But now your brave warriors weep in public. Your ambassadors of peace cry in bitter disappointment. Your roads are deserted. No one travels them anymore. The Assyrians have broken their peace treaty and care nothing of the promises they made before witnesses. They have no respect for anyone. The land of Israel wilts in mourning. Lebanon withers with shame. The plain of Sharon is now a wilderness. Bashan and Carmel have been plundered. But the Lord says, now I will stand up. Now I will show my power and might. You Assyrians produce nothing but dry grass and stubble. Your own breath will turn to fire and consume you. Your people will be burned up completely like thorn bushes cut down and tossed into a fire. Listen to what I have done, you nations far away. And you that are near, acknowledge my might. The sinners in Jerusalem shake with fear. Terror seizes the godless. Who can live with this devouring fire, they cry. Who can survive this all-consuming fire? Those who are honest and fair, who refuse to profit by fraud, who stay far away from bribes, who refuse to listen to those who plot murder, who shut their eyes to all enticement to do wrong. These are the ones who will dwell on high. The rocks of the mountains will be their fortress. Food will be supplied to them, and they will have water in abundance. Your eyes will see the king in all his splendor, and you will see a land that stretches into the distance. You will think back to this time of terror, asking, where are the Assyrian officers who counted our towers? Where are the bookkeepers who recorded the plunder taken from our fallen city? No, uh, You will no longer see these fierce, violent people with their strange, unknown language. Instead, you will see Zion as a place of holy festivals. You will see Jerusalem, a city, quiet and secure. It will be like a tent whose ropes are taut and whose stakes are firmly fixed. The Lord will be our mighty one. He will be like a wide river of protection that no enemy can cross, that no enemy ship can sail upon. For the Lord is our judge, our lawgiver, and our king. He will care for us and save us. The enemy's sails hang loose on broken masts with useless tackle. Their treasure will be divided by the people of God. Even the lame will take their share. The people of Israel will no longer say, we are sick and helpless, for the Lord will forgive their sins. 
man, God's Word is good. And it speaks to me. I hope, I hope as I was reading it, you're applying these truths to yourself, your own enemies, right, that stand against you, and this faith that will be realized one day, right, as we think of, of Bob and Dodd and, and their faith rightly placed in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They are quiet, secure, and confident in what's to come because they have God on their side. And that's our challenge, to, to be that example to the world, proclaiming, you know, the God who is worthy of worship. So let us take a moment to pray and uh, prepare our hearts. Lord, we come together today. We need encouragement. We're so distracted. I think the worries of the world can consume us. And uh, in that, a lot of times we're, we're not seeking your provision. We're not seeking your help. And... Uh, we lose sight of, of where our true value lies, and uh, you are our treasure. Help us to, to always think in those terms and not to, uh, to bring shame to you, Lord, through our maybe broken witness at times. So we do pray that you speak to us with your word, that it helps us, that we can accomplish what you've brought us here to do. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, all right. Hey, I was going to mention just in a, in a passing, uh, uh, we've had a, a visitor lately, and uh, I asked her if it was okay if I had mentioned it, Darlene's here, and uh, interestingly, she said she was at the grocery store, and, uh, and Freeman Dore had kind of got a little conversation with her, and, and Freeman handed her a church invite, complete stranger, but Freeman felt moved to say, hey, here's a lady who, you know, could use some fellowship, potentially, and, and he did it. And sure enough, Darlene shows up. What do they, they say statistically, if you invite someone to church, 85% of the time they're going to come. How can you go wrong? Think of the low risk on that. And uh, I don't know about, uh, you know, I was a little convicted there because I haven't really been handing them out to complete strangers. Easy to hand one out, but uh, I called Freeman up. He was sick last week, and I said, hey, bravo, bravo. <laughs> you know, good job. We want to get this message out to the community, and, and one of the best ways to do it is to invite people to come. So we're glad, we're glad you're here, Darlene, and, uh, and we want to get as many people here because what we give is the Word of God. We give hope where hope should lie, and that's in the person of Jesus Christ. And, uh, Chris? Yes. Freeman also led me to the Lord 50 years ago. Really? So Freeman is this uh, missionary on, on mission, and... He's such a quiet guy, you wouldn't think that, uh, but, well, that's awesome, praise God. So, I don't know if you heard Loretta, but uh, Freeman brought Loretta to the Lord. Um, that's the part we're to play, that's the best that we have to give, is the gospel. The fact that God has uh, proclaimed his kingdom, and uh, that we could be part of that kingdom through what Christ has done. Uh, so, thought I'd share that with you. And hey, if you want uh, a moment of rejoicing with you, I do have a thing on the tear-off. Uh, this was back when we, I was trying to have a system of keeping track of how many invites we, we, we give out. But uh, if you give an invite, you want me to rejoice with you, feel free to check that off and put it in the offering basket. And uh, I won't call you out, but I'll, I'll rejoice with you. That's a beautiful thing. All right. So here we are, going the long way around the barn, but uh, better late than never. Amen. And maybe that's your, that's your story, right? Better late than never. And I think that's okay. I think as long as you get to a point where your faith finally lands on trusting in Jesus Christ, all I can say is, well done. You got there. And I think there's examples of that. Let's turn to Matthew 21. Matthew 21, 28 through 32 is, uh, I think, kind of talking about that. We can, about, we can be all words and no actions, but what matters to God is that one action that you really are required to take. And this is what prevents God from taking you uh, hostage. He's not interested in ca kidnapping you into the kingdom of heaven. He stands at a distance and he waits for you to say yes to him. That is the action that he's waiting on. If you're not born again, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, he's waiting. How long are you going to make him wait? Maybe too long? Hopefully you'll get there eventually. But li listen to what this, I thought of this verse. It says, uh, Matthew 21, verse 28. It says, 
But what do you think about this? A man with two sons told the older boy, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. And the son answers, no, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and he went anyway. And then the father told the other son, you go. And he said, yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. Which of the two obeyed his father? And they replied, the first. And then Jesus explained his meaning. I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe him, while tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sins. Here's that example given, right? One son says, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be there. Uh, or, or he says, excuse me, the first one says, no, I'm not coming. And eventually he comes. The other son says, oh, yeah, 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 I'll be there. But he never shows up. Which of those two is going to be saved in the end, right? It's going to be the one who finally says yes to God. Better late than never. I think we see it also in Luke 23. Let's turn to that. Luke 23. Luke 23 is, you know, maybe this is a, these are words of encouragement for someone who's gone a very long time and is still on the fence. It's not too late as long as you have breath in your lungs. But don't wait too long. The wise man does it once, what the fool does it last. Better late than never. Uh, Luke 23, verse 39. We all know this story, and we probably use this in, in the same context. It says, One of the criminals hanging beside Jesus scoffed, So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Man, is that good news? Better late than never. Here's a, a criminal being crucified next to Christ. He's on the cross and he asks Jesus for mercy, that he might be part of his kingdom. And Jesus says, you will be. And that's awesome. And I think that, is, uh, that shows the long-suffering and patience of the God that we serve. God is patient. He's tolerant. He's kind. And because of that, that should draw you in. That should get your attention. That should allow you to stop living a life consumed by sin, and living a life that is fulfilling to Him, that enjoys the good things that He's given us, and we give Him credit. And that's the message that we have to offer. And uh, So on your Explorer sheet, I, I did write those two verses, if you want to look at them later, uh, right under that main idea. But the question is, why do some leave Jesus as their last resort? And I wanted to try to bring it in an application to uh, folks that might be hesitating. I think the first point there is we fear that he may not show up. Isn't that the case? I think people probably wonder, uh, you know, is Jesus actually going to show up? Do you think Israel was wondering that very thing? The Jews within the city, looking out over the walls, seeing the Assyrians sacking city after city in the horizon? Do you think that might have crossed their mind that, Maybe God's not going to show up. And I think sometimes we think that. And that's why we end up seeking other ways of coping with uh, the dangers, with the, the heartache and with the hurt and the guilt of life. We're not so sure he's going to show up, but uh, I'm glad to say that he did show up and that it, it's an exciting thing. Why don't we turn to 2 Kings 18. I did want to share a little bit in there. It's easy not to dive into uh, 
Kings because we'll get consumed in that too. And Isaiah is a big enough book on its own. But you need to know that there is a story going on in, in 2 Kings of what's actually happening. Isaiah is speaking to this. And actually there's references right here in the chapter of Isaiah. And uh, there's a lot of instances of the arrogance of the Assyrian king, uh, Sennacherib of Assyria. And it uh, might be worth looking at a little bit here. So here in uh, 2 Kings chapter 18, if we look at verse 13, we'll, we'll get a, a sense of what's going on. It says, In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, King Seren, uh, Sennacherib of Assyria came to attack the fortified towns of Judah and conquered them. King Hezekiah sent this message to the king of Assyria uh, at uh, Lachism. I have done wrong. I will pay whatever tribute money you demand if you only will withdraw. So here's Hezekiah's moment of weakness where he, he basically says, okay, uh, you know, I get it. You're coming for us. And I'm sorry. I'll do whatever it takes to get you to turn away. And the king of Assyria demanded a settlement. He had him right where he wanted him. And what did he want? He wanted 11 tons of silver and one ton of gold. And here are some sad verses. Verse 15 and 16. Boy, are these sad. To gather this amount, King Hezekiah used all the silver stored in the temple of the Lord and in the palace treasury. And Hezekiah even stripped the gold from the doors of the Lord's temple and from the doorposts he had overlaid with gold, and he gave it all to the Assyrian king. So he had taken the gold from the, uh, the doorposts and the door. I guess I, I uh, misspoke earlier. But, so here he is stripping gold from the doorposts and the doors uh, to the Lord's temple. And isn't that kind of what we're doing whenever we don't trust in the Lord. We're taking God's glory. We're taking what is rightfully His for His delight and we're stripping it and we're giving it to someone else. That is what sin is, I think. Sin is a, a way in which we give in to the pressures of life and instead of honoring the Lord, we honor ourselves. And, and I don't say it lightly, right? Because I'm a sinner too. I sin. And I'm left with that same thing of thinking afterwards, you know, that was stupid. That was pointless. Didn't have to do that. But that's the battle that goes on within. And I think the best way in which we can uh, respond to that is not to suppress it and, and press it down to take that long way around the barn, but just to come right out and confess it and say, Lord, you know, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. Please forgive me. In that moment, we repent and turn to Christ. And that, that helps us. That renews us. That gets us back to where we should be, which is walking by the Spirit. So, why do we leave Jesus as our last resort? We, we fear that he may not show up. And in that, we, we take alternate routes. And that's what Hezekiah did in a moment of weakness. But what happens, right? In the moment of uh, this glimmer of hope in the world, uh, the world doesn't show up. And that's basically the uh, message to you today, right? Whatever it is you're trusting in, it's not going to get you over the cross line, uh, the finish line. We need the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and rightfully so, just to hop back to Isaiah, and uh, if you want to stay in Isaiah, I'll, I'll read stuff from the Second Kings, but... Hezekiah, you know, I think in the, the moment of betrayal, understood that he was foolish. That these people do not keep uh, their bargains. And we see it in verse 7 through 8. It says, but now your brave warriors weep in public. Your ambassadors of peace cry in bitter disappointment. And your roads are deserted. No one travels them anymore. So here they sent these people out with all this you know, 11 tons of silver and gold, and, and they brought the tribute, and their hope was in the fact that they would appease the king of Assyria, and then word came back, no, we're still coming. You know, you can imagine, what? They had sold their soul 
for just a little bit more time and it wasn't even going to work. It says the Assyrians have broken their peace treaty and they care nothing for the promises they have made before witnesses. They have no respect for anyone. And then uh, Isaiah uses all these nat- national parks, basically, these p- places of beauty. And uh, in all these places of beauty, there is shame and mourning and there is, uh, there is grief. But then I love in verse 10 of Isaiah, it says, but, but the Lord says, now I will stand up. Now I will show my power and might. And why did that occur? I guess why don't you go back to Second, uh, Second Kings chapter 18, because there are some, some uh, good moments of turning here, good moments of repentance that are a good example for us. Second Kings 18, it's like two chapters long, a lot of uh, chronicle. So the Assyrian king, they send messages, uh, they sent a message to uh, Hezekiah. This is in verse 19. Let's look at this. Pretty interesting stuff. Look what the, the Assyrian king's message is to Hezekiah. So after he gave the tribute and, uh, so the, the Assyrian king says, this is what the great king of Assyria says. This is verse 19. What are you trusting in that makes you so confident? Do you think that mere words can substitute for military skill and strength? Who are you counting on that you have rebelled against me? On Egypt. If you lean on Egypt, it will be like a reed that splinters beneath your weight and pierces your hand. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, is completely unreliable. So the Assyrian the Assyrian king is mocking Israel, and they think, well, maybe you're trusting in Egypt, right? This was after Hezekiah. They went back on the, uh, you know, the tribute they gave, and Hezekiah you know, is going to repent and trust in the Lord. But look, verse 22, it says, but perhaps you will say to me, we are trusting in the Lord our God. So the Assyrian king is mocking him, saying, well, maybe you think that your God's going to get you out of trouble. <clears throat> But then look what it says. It says, but isn't he the one who was insulted by Hezekiah? Didn't Hezekiah tear down his shrines and altars and make everyone in Judah and Jerusalem worship only at the altar here in Jerusalem? Look at how blind the Assyria king is. He actually knew that Hezekiah had torn down all the pagan shrines that his father had set up. And he foolishly was thinking that the God of those pagan shrines was the God they were trusting in. Boy, were they going to be wrong. The God that they were trusting in is the only God, Yahweh, and the only place to worship Yahweh is in Jerusalem. So Hezekiah was doing exactly what he was supposed to do, but they didn't get it. They continued to mock them. And then uh, the king of Assyria goes on to make an offer. And uh, that's in verse 28 through 35. And I guess that's like sin, uh, pouring honey in our ears, this idea that, hey, if you just give in, you'll, you'll, you'll have everything you need if you just give in. So they're tempting Hezekiah to give up. And they were proclaiming this from the walls. Um, and in verse 36, it said the people stayed silent. They didn't, they didn't respond to what was being said. And then look what it says in verse 37. It says the uh, Alikam, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the court secretary, and Joan, son of As- Asaph, the royal historian, were back, went back to Hezekiah. They tore their clothes in despair, and they went in to see the king and told him what the Assyrian chief of staff had said. And then look, at here's that moment of turning. He finally gets to the door of the barn, right? When King Hezekiah heard their report, he tore his clothes and put on burlap, and he went into the temple of the Lord. And he said to Alikam, the palace administrator, Shebna, the court secretary, and the leading priest, all dressed in burlap, to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amaz, they told him, This is what King Ahaz says. So King Hezekiah repents, 
is mourning his sin, puts on burlap, sends a message to the, to the prophet Isaiah. <clears throat> and what is it, the message? This is what the king Hezekiah says. Today is a day of trouble, insults, and disgrace. It is like when a child is ready to be born, but the mother has no strength to deliver the baby. But perhaps the Lord your God has heard the Assyrian chief of staff sent by the king to defy the living God, and he will punish him for his words. Oh, pray for those of us who are left. In that moment, he has come to the end of his rope, just like that thief on the cross standing next to Jesus. Hezekiah turns to Isaiah and says, Will the Lord show up? Please. We are looking to Him to come. And it says that Isaiah sends a message to the king. Verse 6, it says, Say to your master, this is what the Lord says, Do not be disturbed by this blasphemous speech against me from the Assyrian king's messengers. Listen. I myself will move against him, and the king will and the king will receive a message that he is in, is needed at home, so he will return to his land where I will have him killed with a sword. So Isaiah gives the message to the king. He's heard your message, and he's going to say yes. And I think that's the call for us, right? In our moment of distress, in our moment of procrastination of trusting in the Lord for us to finally do right what the wise man does at once. When we finally say, Lord, you're in charge, I trust in you, the message comes back, the Lord is going to show up. And what's the message he gives? He says that king's going to be dead soon. And he, he does orchestrate king, uh, uh, the Assyrian king, and he goes back, and he goes into his pagan temple, and who is it that kills him? Two of his sons assassinate him right there at the altar. In verse 15 in chapter 19, uh, Hezekiah prayed this prayer before the Lord. O oh Lord, God of Israel, You are enthroned between the mighty cherubim. You alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heavens and the earth. Bend down, O Lord, and listen. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to Sennacherib's words of defiance against the living God. It is true. Uh, it is true, Lord, that the king of Assyria has destroyed all these nations, and they have thrown the gods of these nations into the fire and burned them. But of course the Assyrians could never destroy them. They were not gods at all. Only idols of wood and stone shaped by human hands. But, O oh Lord our God, rescue us from His power. Then all the kingdoms of earth will know that You alone are Lord. Uh, o oh Lord our God. Wow, you know, what an amazing moment for Hezekiah where he says all those gods they thought they destroyed, they weren't gods at all because there's only one God and it's You. And what is he concerned with at this moment? He's concerned that the the uh, the reputation of God, the glory of God is being trampled on, and that is his motive. I don't want to see your name dishonored among these people. And isn't that supposed to be our prayer? Think of the prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples when they said, let us know how to pray, right? Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. May your name be holy. Your kingdom come, right? Give me this day my daily bread. It's a call for us to put the honor of God above all else, to rely on Him daily for what we need. And here Hezekiah has finally done that, and God shows up, and He takes care of the enemy, and that's what He does for us. So that first point... We fear he may not show up. That's foolish. The second thing some people do in uh, making Jesus their last resort is they think they have other options. I think we see here that Hezekiah thought he had other options. The third point is we understand given, that our, given our unfaithfulness, he probably shouldn't show up. Anyone want to confess to that? 
When we pray for something, we understand in the back of our minds that I really don't deserve anything from the Lord. We are unworthy. We are unworthy just as Hezekiah was unworthy. Look at what he had just done. He had just stripped the gold from the doorposts of the temple. And then he finally comes to his senses, turns to the Lord, and what does the Lord say? Finally, you finally come to your senses. And he says, yes. We may think that our unfaithfulness means that God is not faithful, but we know otherwise. Even in our unfaithfulness, He remains faithful. And He wants us to turn. To turn from the sin that we've been relying on and to turn to Him. And it's good to know that He does. So just to go back to Isaiah 33... Uh, verse 11. And here it's just kind of a, a judgment against the Assyrians, talking about how they produce nothing but dry grass and stubble. And it really gets to the, the verse that I wanted to talk about. I, I put a little graphic on the inside of your bulletin if you, if you want to look at it there. I put a little fire and it says, The sinners in Jerusalem. Um, actually, what verse is this? 14, yep. So it says uh, in verse 13, I didn't include that, it says, Listen to what I have done, you nations far away, and you that are near, acknowledge my might. And then that verse in, uh, in the bulletin, The sinners in Jerusalem shake with fear. Terror seizes the godless. Who can live with this devouring fire? They cry. Who can survive all his, this all-consuming fire? And that's a scary thought, right? I hate, you know, even just the thought of putting fire down. Maybe I'm preaching fire and brimstone. I want you to be afraid. And in a sense, I do. God is holy. And He is just. He cannot look away from sin. He has to hit it straight on. He has to deal with it. And the question comes, like, how is anyone going to survive that consuming fire. And what comes next almost seems like good works. Well, if you're a good person, you'll be okay. But I think what happens really in the heart of someone that has been given mercy is you become a new creation. You become a new person. And you love what's good and you love what's right because you love the Lord who is just and right. So my, my challenge to you as you think of this verse is who's, who's going to survive the coming fire? It's someone who's been made new in Christ. Only then are you going to loosen your grip on the things that this world is trying to get you to hang on to. I guess I thought of it in terms of like being a billionaire, right? If you're a billionaire, are you apt to take a bribe? You know, what's a bribe to you? Hey, I'll give you a hundred bucks to, uh, you know, to overlook this. A billionaire doesn't need your money. And in the same way, someone who has been made anew in Christ, he doesn't need sin in the same way that he did before. He can actually put the good things of life first. He can turn the other cheek. He can love his enemy because he's a rich man. He's rich in Christ. And I think that's what this is talking about. Who are the... Those who are honest and fair, who refuse profit by fraud, who stay away from the bribes, who refuse to listen to those who plot murder, who shut their eyes to all entitlement to do wrong. These are the ones who will dwell on high. The ones who have been transformed by the grace and mercy of God. And I think that's you. If you know God the way I know God and you love Him, then the Satan doesn't have his hooks in you anymore. You don't need the sin that you think might get you out of this temporary trouble because you know God is too good to leave you uh, all alone through the struggles you're in. So that fourth point on your explorer sheet, we think he has better things to do. He loves you. He wants to give you the kingdom. Don't ever underestimate how much He loves you. Uh, if you ever do, just look at the cross, right? A holy God who should have been worshipped and adored was crucified. He allowed that to happen because you matter. 
you matter to him. He does not have better things to do. He does what he does for you. And then that last point on your sheet, better late than never may be all you've got. If you have not given your life to Christ, my challenge to you is stop waiting. You show me a God more worthy of worship and I'll listen. But I don't think he's there. He doesn't exist. This is perfection. This is worthy of your worship. So my challenge for you is to come to him, to be his. Surrender your life to him. Give your sin to him. And if you do, you'll understand and you will see the king in all his splendor. Just as verse 17 says in Isaiah 33, it says your eyes will see the king in all his splendor and you will see a land that stretches into the distance. God has planned great things for those who trust in him. And I just pray that uh, if you haven't made that decision, you make it now and that we can rejoice with you. Let's take a moment to pray. Lord, it's, uh, it's great to know that even though uh, we are so unworthy, Lord, you hold out for change in us even to the very end. And that if we come to our senses and recognize we have no other options, that you are willing to show up and that you have shown up, that you showed up on the cross and did what was necessary in order for sinful people to be in your presence. Lord, help us to see no other options, to trust in no other options, that we would honor you, that we would care about your glory, that uh, we would make that prayer every day, that your name would be holy, and that all good things come from you, that we would seek your provision each day for all that we need. We pray for anyone here, Lord, who's on that fence, that they stop standing there, looking off in the distance, thinking something better might show up. There is nothing better than you, Lord. You're so good. You love even your enemies. And Lord, we know that we were your enemies when we were dead in our sin, and and we rejoice that you've made us anew. And uh, we pray that we bring this message to the world. That we uh, step out of our comfort zones and maybe give an invite to someone that we might think maybe would never come, but uh, you'll prove us wrong. We thank you, Lord, for this day. In Jesus' name, amen.